going to jump into a conversation now with Father Ezra Sullivan. Uh, he is with the Order of Preachers, a Dominican out of the province of St. Joseph, about yoga, something we all are familiar with, because I'm sure we know someone, if not if not you, dear listener, somebody you know, I'm sure, has been practicing yoga, over 20 million yoga practitioners uh, in, in growing, I imagine. But I have personally encountered many Catholics who who are into yoga, and we thought we'd have a conversation around that, because Father Ezra has a whole series of articles on this subject over at spiritualdirection.com, and he joins us now by Zoom. Good morning to you, Father Ezra. Good morning. How are you? Praise be to God. I am alive, and that counts. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I'm here in Rome. It's a sunny day, and uh, just doing well. Wonderful. Praise be to Jesus. Uh, you're a moral theologian, uh, by way of uh, disclaimer there. So I think this isn't one of those hot-button issues. In fact, I mean, I've gotten away with a lot of crazy topics uh, on the program, but this may be the most controversial topic we will ever talk about, uh, yoga. Because so many Catholics uh, are participating in yoga, and you hear it from from talking heads, subject matter experts. They'll say, "Oh, it's no big deal. It's breathing. It's it's uh, stretching." I don't know why you're so bent out of shape. So we hear that a lot. But what is the real deal with yoga? Maybe you can start by defining it, Father Ezra. Yeah. So um, yoga is difficult to define because it. it exists in a lot of different forms and um, I would say overall we it, it is a comprehensive system of human culture which includes physical moral and psychological elements it acts as a doorway to this gently sloping path toward yoga proper which is actually a spiritual exercise to unite yourself with the entire universe you know, Father, my roommate, I live with a couple guys, uh, friends of mine, and one of my roommates is a convert from Hinduism. He uh, mm. recently, about uh, two years ago, and, you know, there's uh, the problem with uh, that a lot of people have with it. They say, okay, well, you know, I can have a Christian yoga. I can uh, make it Catholic, have Catholic meditations instead of these other meditations, and I can have this kind of syncretism. But the problem is, and I've noticed this talking to my friends who, who my friend who is Hindu, and, or one was Hindu and he was telling me he's like yeah I mean my mom she's totally she was like why do you have to become Catholic why can't you just add Jesus to your to to one of the gods that we pray to uh, that's fine you could do that no big deal and uh, there's a failure of understanding of what the connection between the Hindu faith and why it's incompatible with the Christian faith could you comment on that Yes, absolutely. When I was in India, I saw exactly what you're describing. Namely, I, I visited people's houses and they would have on their walls a picture of Ganesh, which is the elephant headed god uh, in Hinduism. And then they would have a picture, say, the Sacred Heart. And for them, Jesus was another incarnation of the general divine. And so they could have multiple gods and, oh, well, Jesus is the one who helps me with some things. Ganesh helps me with other things. And and um, in many yoga studios, even in the United States, there will be Sanskrit chants where people will call upon those gods in order to receive their power and their help. It's astonishing. Um, sometimes you'll see a, a statue of Buddha or of Shiva, and it shows the religious origins of yoga. And so just as we can't have Catholic Hinduism, so we can't have Catholic yoga. Just not possible. It that's interesting because I was thinking about the fact that uh, when you mentioned the, the point about Sanskrit, my friend, when he converted to Catholicism, uh, but he was a brand new Catholic and he still had a little bit of lingerings of the uh, of his Hindu beliefs. He would he showed up one day and he was like, "Oh yeah, I was studying Sanskrit with my with my uncle and he was uh, and we start off by praying to Sanskrit and I and he had this idea that the the gods or these like these uh, concepts in Hinduism are like are are neutral but he what if it was failed to be uh, brought to his attention when he was converting is saint paul's admonition that all the gods of the pagans are demons and so even these like minor things that seem to be kind of like they're not actually a god you know we're just we're just like praying to an a idea or a concept and that concept and idea ultimately brings us to the uh to the divine to god uh, himself uh, what about those kind of situations 
Well, again, you know, the, it, when, when I was in uh, India, one of the things that was brought home to me is that some people had a notion like the gods really existed, that they could have power, and you could call upon them for specific things. They would even pray to um, material elements like the Ganges River. But then another guru, he pointed out to me, he said, well, it's really the simple people who believe in those gods. He says the more sophisticated gurus, which I guess he included himself, he said, well, we believe that all the gods are just illusions. They're ultimately um, just avatars of this greater divinity that exists everywhere. In, in either case, Catholics cannot call upon these gods, whether whether you know we believe that they're demons or whether we believe they're just illusions or metaphors for some other kind of Hinduistic understanding of divinity. Um, as you say, uh, St. Paul pointed out that all the gods of the pagans are demons. That was the understanding of Zeus and of you know, Aphrodite and Mars and all the Greek gods. And Catholics very early on were martyred for not praying to those gods, for not calling upon them. So the witness of the early church, I think, is really one of the best examples for us to approach yoga now is to say that just as the early Christians could never have had any kind of syncretistic union with Greek or pagan ideas, ne neither can Christians nowadays with any Hinduistic ideas of the gods. We have just about a couple of minutes left uh, before we have to go to a quick break. We're talking with Father Ezra Sullivan, OP, about the dangers of yoga from a Catholic perspective. What, uh, Father, let me play a devil's advocate for just one sec real quick. Uh, call it you is, Father. My yoga studio doesn't have a Buddhist statue, no Sanskrit chanting going down. It's just breathing and stretching. What would you say to that? I would say what they're doing might not even be yoga at all. Um, one of the very interesting things I've discovered in doing uh, research on the history of some yoga postures is that uh, some of them actually were derived from Swedish body, body lifting culture in the 19th century. And what happened is there were actually men from India who went to England who discovered you know, gymnastics and uh, stretching and so on. They brought it back to India. This is the early 1900s, or, uh, late 1800s. And then they, they incorporated that into yoga. And so, so it's very complicated actually to say, oh, well, one posture is yoga and one posture is not yoga. But I think it, it's, it's easier just to say, avoid yoga in general under whatever name it is. Because what happens is almost always people get involved in yoga for physical reasons and they end up staying in it for spiritual reasons even if there's not a sanskrit chant or a god that they're praying to per se people get sucked into it because it has this syncretistic um tendency in general we had a one of our cdt insiders uh christopher chance was asking uh, father mentioned different types of yoga could he elaborate on that and let me just uh, sort of throw in with that question with christopher there the different types of yoga going to something uh, you were addressing at the uh, right before we went to break. And that, and that keeps coming back to mind. A lot of Catholics who, who say that they are participating really try to you know, make the argument that this is harmless, there's nothing going on. So in the different types of yoga that you might address here, I wonder, is there, is there a version that is truly harmless, it, you know, a, absolutely harmless from a Catholic perspective, or is the answer to that no, and we'll have to have concern for all types? A Father Ezra Sullivan. So if it's yoga, it's not compatible with Christianity. That, that, that's just the fundamental premise we have to start with. And therefore, any kind of yoga is spiritually dangerous to Christians. Now, some stretching and breathing isn't yoga. And that's where it becomes a little bit difficult, where um, if you look at some yoga practitioners, they will do stretching that you find in gymnastics, or they'll actually use other kinds of exercises, say found in Pilates, or things that people have, you know, just sitting cross-legged. Well, sitting cross-legged isn't particular to yoga. People do that in cultures all around the world. So we, we have to be really clear, though, that when I say all yoga is dangerous for Christians, what I mean is it's a system. And when people accept this practice as a system, then they may start out with simple bodily postures, but pretty soon they may start eating in a different way. 
they may start practicing um, morals in a certain way and their own spirituality starts to slowly change so that's why i would say it's not dangerous to do some kinds of breathing it's not dangerous to do some kinds of stretching you know, breathing and stretching are things that are natural to human beings but yoga as a system is always dangerous now father aside from breaking potentially breaking well actually you would break the first commandment in this situation which is worse is it's bad enough um what would you say to a catholic who is not convinced about so the spiritual I, dangers one of the one of the dangers of the yoga philosophy in general is it starts to believe that the individual is divine and what happens then is instead of worshiping god who is three persons father son and holy spirit separate from us who created us instead people who practice yoga start to believe that they themselves are equivalent to the divine and so it actually becomes a kind of a narcissistic self-worship which is you know <laughs> something that modern people are quite amenable to unfortunately I, I don't know, Father. Uh, I, do, uh, I do curls with a fork uh, many times a day, so I'm trying to keep this body looking as good as possible. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't need to go to yoga to do that. But at any rate, uh, I joke. Um, what, about the, what about the dangers of the body? Like, I want you to elaborate on that, what you were just saying, because I've heard you talk about this before. It, it, the dangers on the person who practices yoga, it, what are, what's the spectrum here? I mean, I've heard that exercise have talked about this so that's sort of more on the extreme level but what about the other opposite end of that spectrum what are the sort of the the easier or the the lighter stuff maybe you could speak to that Yes, yes. So certainly I have talked with exorcists who um, they've known uh, women who were uh, possessed by demons because of calling upon them in Sanskrit prayers in the context of yoga. Absolutely true. Um, that does not happen for the most part for most yoga practitioners. You really have to be deeply, typically into what is called kundalini yoga. But even on, on um, a, say, a less dangerous but, sp but still dangerous level is what I was describing as this kind of theological narcissism whereby people start to worship their body they want themselves to look as beautiful as possible and then it leads to this kind of vanity where everything becomes focused in their life around a certain kind of look around um, wanting people to acknowledge somehow that they are superior in some way and and of course this is this is related to a very specific culture um, in the United States it's mostly upper class um, or upper middle middle class women who have a lot of free time who are able to uh, practice this yoga whereas people who are busily working and they're, they're involved in lots of other activities you're naturally less narcissistic because you're able to focus on the good of other people so i'm not saying that all yoga practitioners are egoistic or narcissistic but it can tend to lead to that direction when people start to think oh i am a goddess mm -hmm. and people will say that in some kind of literal sense it's it's, it's astonishing mm -hmm. you know father i was thinking when you said that i was thinking immediately of your article i think it was the number uh, your our second article you say um, i have the quote here and i want to get your comment on it you said ellen is a medical student and thinks of herself as a rational person who doesn't go in for mystical experiences but one day as she closed her eyes and relaxed in savasana Ellen felt a powerful maternal energy around her and saw the Hindu goddess Durga, whose picture graced the yoga studio's back wall. For a moment, the many-armed goddess face lingered in front of her, looking alive and full of compassionate love. Then the image disappeared, though through though the sweet, strong energy stayed with Ellen for hours. Uh, what exactly are you talking about here, and what is this? What is this going on? Well, in this case, this this was a demonic manifestation that. Um, this this maternal goddess supposedly um, that exists within hinduistic mythology can manifest itself in different forms and durga is one of them shakti is another one and um, ellen in this case she because of her deep level of meditation and her approach to some of these prayers she actually started to witness the demon manifesting itself to her as a kind of maternal force um, and, and, and this is where it becomes extremely dangerous, where if a person isn't spiritually sophisticated and knows to reject that spiritual force immediately, it can creep into their life and they can actually start to try to draw energy from it. Wow. And you'll see this in um, one of the one of the 
publications that's um, most widely read is called Yoga Journal, and they will actually encourage people to call upon the goddess within mm. in order to practice yoga more effectively. And this is what we're talking about, is this um, this demonic force first manifesting itself as maternal, but eventually it starts to take over a person's life and it undermines their own God-given femininity. You know, that makes me think of the fact that, you know, it's very apropos that you as a Dominican are attacking this uh, error because you're talking about the the fact that it's a contrary to the body. Even like the innocuous versions of uh, yoga are an attack against the body and the soul composite, which, you know, the Dominicans fighting against the Albigensian heresy. Could you talk about how those relates and maybe how the rosary and Catholic spirituality can actually be a proper uh, way to try to get what? What some people are seeking from yoga modern life is essentially imbalanced some people will focus so much on the goods of the body whether how they look or their pleasure that they forget that the soul really matters and our own moral stance with respect to god is what gives us our primary dignity with grace operating in the soul but other people will say oh it doesn't matter what i do with my body and therefore only the thing that matters is my intention and as long as my intention is good i can do whatever i like with my body and and Catholics have the balanced understanding, which is your body and soul are united organically in your single person. And just as Jesus Christ, he's God incarnate. So our, our way of understanding our own dignity is to see the dignity of Christ and then to try to imitate him both in our body, our physical actions, as well as in our souls by worshiping God alone. So ultimately, we have this this unification of body and soul, which is why in the sacred liturgy, we kneel down. This is why we use holy water. This is why we use incense and candles, because we are bodily beings, and what we do with our body can help our spirit. So the rosary is a great example of that. Insofar as we can pray, you know, we have the rosary in our hands, we're moving our fingers across the beads, but we're also saying the words, and we're trying to use our imagination in order to to recall the mysteries of the life of Christ. So it actually is an integrative prayer, you know, that integrates all of these senses that we have in the rosary, while also leading us beyond the senses to the realm of faith. Father, I want you to comment on indifferentism in yoga. I mean, today we're looking at the gospel today and uh, about the light of Christ not being held under a bushel basket or head, held under a bed, but put on a candlestick for the whole world to see. And the early church fathers uh, make it clear that we are, we're to live a godly life and let that light shine in the world around us. And yet, having said that, Haydock in his commentary today warned us about being indifferent to the gospel that's been proclaimed, this gift that we've been given. And I think many, many Catholics are kind of in this same boat. They're like, oh, come on, it's not that bad. You're, you're overdoing it. And they're just going to continue on doing what they're doing. Is this one of the spiritual dangers that Catholics will face if they practice yoga? Absolutely. Because yoga tends towards syncretism, what it does is it will try to erase or dissolve the distinctions between Christianity and non-Christian religions. And, uh, you know, as Catholics, we know that Christ is the only God incarnate. There aren't multiple avatars. There aren't multiple gods. There's one God and him alone do we serve. And to love him with all of our hearts is the first commandment. And so what happens is as people start to practice this vague spirituality, it starts to lead to indifferentism, not only with respect to the person of Christ, but also with respect to all of the things that make Catholicism distinct. Suddenly the liturgy seems less important. Some, suddenly our moral claims seem less important. And then everything sinks down to this more general level where all things become, as it were, united in a vague kind of gray mass. Whereas when we go to you know church, we see the distinctions among things but that are united harmoniously. All right. Well, we are out of time. Father Ezra Sullivan, OP, thank you for your time today. Very insightful conversation. We have linked up to this series of articles on this topic. Some really good insights. Share this with friends and family who are in this category. It might make a big impact on their lives. Spiritualdirection.com. Look for its articles there. Father Ezra, God love you. God bless you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. God bless you, too. All right. That's going to do it for hour number one of Catholic Drive Time. Praise be to God. Thank you.